Tommy Kissinger here. Thank you so much for joining us again. This is Tommy's Truth Talk. And in just a minute, we're going to be getting into the tension in creation, part 11, as we will be continuing to read from the writings of Dr. Stephen Jones. But before we do that, we just ask if you hit that like button, if you just smash the thumbs up button, it so helps us going forward. If you will like the videos, and if you would please consider subscribing to the channel if you have not done so already so we can continue to grow this channel, grow the movement of the great message of the ultimate restoration of all things through the Lord Jesus Christ. So as promised, we're going to pick up where we left off, continuing to talk about this tension in creation and we must understand, as we finished up last time, that God, he planned all this tension from the beginning. He made himself liable for the sins of the whole world and then paid its full penalty. And this is plainly stated in the revelation of his law. So God is creator. You own what you create. He's even created tension in creation. And God is liable, as we have stated. He's liable. He's made himself liable on purpose to bring about this great ultimate restoration of all things. And as we understand the purpose and plan of God and the restoration of all things, we must understand some things about good and evil. Ladies and gentlemen, the first thing you have to understand is that God is in complete control of good and evil. God created good and evil. In Isaiah chapter 45, it tells us that that he has created good and evil, light and darkness. Well, it would go on to stand that God has also created opposition, period. Love and hate, bitter and sweet, and so on down the line, anything you can name, God has created this opposition, this friction, this tension in creation to bring about a desired end where the Apostle Paul said that every knee would bow to Jesus Christ and every tongue would confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So let's hear some comments here about good and evil and how they are subject to time. Before anything physical was created, God created time. You got to understand that time is a created thing, okay? In the Bible, time is divided into ages, and then each age is further subdivided into jubilees, which are 49-year periods, Sabbath rest years, seven-year cycles, years, months, and days. God created all of this, okay? This world order is subject to time. This not only includes the physical creation, but also the ideas and concepts that go with it including authority, justice, good, and evil. These things, having been created by God, operate in the confines of time, which has also been created by God, okay? In ancient Greek mythology, Kronos, time was said to be the son of earth and heaven. He was brought to birth by heaven, i.e. created by God, but only by means of the earth. It was meant to portray the idea that time is temporary. In fact, mythology said that Kronos devoured his children because all that is begotten of time will eventually be consumed by time as well. Good and evil are children of time, ladies and gentlemen, okay? And as such will be swallowed up when time is no more. Since good and evil are defined by the law of God, it is apparent that the law itself as such will also pass away. Jesus made reference to this in Matthew 5, 18. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass away from the law until all is accomplished. When all is fulfilled at some future time, then and only then will the law pass away. It is yet with us today, but at the end of time, it will pass away along with the concepts of good and evil. Paul told Timothy that the law was not made for the righteous, but for the unrighteous, the lawless, the sinners. 
The law will no longer be needed at the end of time for all will instinctively obey and glorify God in every way. How beautiful is that? If the law was made for the unrighteous, the lawless and the sinners at the end of the plan of God, when every knee bows to Jesus Christ and every tongue confesses that he is Lord to the glory of God, the father. And at the end of, of the great age of the ages and all of the purification of the lake of fire, the judgment of the fiery divine law. Well, God's going to be all in all. And when God is all in all, everything to everyone, well, at that time, there will be no more unrighteous, no more lawless, and no more sinners. And it would stand to reason, as Stephen Jones has brought out, that the law at that time, there won't be a need for it. So, the law will no longer be needed at the end of time for all will instinctively obey and glorify God in every way. In fact, this is the ultimate goal of the new covenant. Hebrews 8, 10 and 11 actually says this and states it. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. This is something God's doing. This is God's new covenant and that's why we can rejoice in it. God says, I will put my laws into their minds and I will write them upon their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people and they shall not teach everyone his fellow citizen and everyone his neighbor saying, know the Lord for all shall know me from the least to the greatest of them. Oh, wow. How beautiful is that? All will eventually know the Lord. That is God's promise, God's oath. He has sworn this is going to be his doing, his new covenant. This is what he's up to. Good and evil are products of time, not eternity. They deal with questions of defining law, which will pass away when no longer needed. It will be the same with faith, which passes away by sight. It will be the same with hope, which passes away when its object is realized. Of the great three concepts, only love will transcend time and will last forever, which has been stated in 1 Corinthians 13, 13. And so Dr. Stephen Jones has also introduced us there to the concepts of time and eternity because they're really different. God is eternal. Something that is eternal has no beginning and no ending. It just is. And that is why God refers to himself as the great I am or I am that I am. But time is a created thing and we must understand that it has a beginning and it has an ending. That's why also this idea of eternal punishment is absolute ridiculousness. Because if you say eternal punishment, that would mean that the punishment has no beginning and no ending. It just is because that's the definition of eternity. So we have to understand there is a difference between time, which is a created thing, which has a beginning and an ending and eternity, which just simply is that speaks of no beginning and no ending. You see, this is why God created time because change takes place in the confines of this created time or the ages that God has created. That's why all of the dealings of God with man are within the confines of time. So even punishment, wrath, vengeance, destruction, judgment, punishment, fire, hell, the lake of fire, you name it. They are Ionios. They are of the ages or belonging to the ages of time or within the confines of time. And they're for the purpose of correction. And when the correction brings about the desired end, well, it's no longer needed. But life is going to continue beyond the ages, beyond the ages of time. But these other things that God has created, good and evil, punishment, wrath, vengeance, destruction, judgment, hell, lake of fire, things of that nature, they're within the confines of time. They'll pass away in time when they bring about the desired end. And what is that desired end that we have spoken of so many times? Well, Paul hit the nail on the head in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 at the end of that grand and glorious passage 
where it says that our God shall be all in all.